I will take you on a tour through my dollhouse. And the dollhouse is a very nice environment. Because when the child says, well, the stove is really hot and the food is cooking, you would never as an adult say, no, that is not true. It's in the mind and in the imagination that the stove is hot. So I will take you through my dollhouse. As you can see at the very end, maybe after you left, oh, his stove was not cooking. It was really cold. So I will talk about concepts and trying to build a dollhouse around certain thoughts. The talk will have, will be divided into four chapters. Tools, matter, and time. Time across generations. Making digital data run and stand still and run again. The digital time capsule. Tools. We have basically two set of tools. The most common tools are the ones which change matter. We take a hammer, we drive a nail into the wall, we have a screw, we have a car which moves us from place A to place B. We have the stove, we have a nuclear reactor, which is also changing matter into something else. We have a microscope which changes matter so we can see something which we could not see otherwise. We have a gun to kill remotely, and we have a hat to protect us. <clears throat> Most tools we have are meant and are used to change a state of matter into something else. They're specifically built for how the matter should be changed. Then we have tools to measure, to quantify, and to compare sizes. These are basically empty tools. They don't mean anything. Like if you have a piano to keep the door open, the piano will feel insulted because it wasn't meant to do something else. If you have a tape measure, the tape measure does not care about what you do, what you measure with it. If you have a scale, it doesn't matter either. If you're measuring time, there are many different ways. Like in the center, you have a water clock where the water runs out of the top. So you have all these, like the candle clock, the candle burns down, and you have markings in the back, which tells you how much time has passed, or the sundial. All these things which we measure actually need interpretation. Is it, do we measure a nail? Do we measure a shelf? What does measuring time actually mean? It is in relation to something which is passing and which we want to keep control of or track of. So these tools, which are empty tools, need the interpretation of not only what do I measure, but what does the measure actually mean. And then we started to mechanize and equalize measurement with mechanical tools. Here we have the clock, now not a sand clock, not a water clock, but a mechanical system which runs around at a specified speed and which allows us actually now to synchronize people, to synchronize actions, but still it's a matter of interpretation. Again, what are we measuring for what purpose? Just measuring time is totally ridiculous. No one just says, oh, this was 23 seconds, unless they want to put it in a context which actually means something or creates meaning. And equally empty tools are like an abacus or calculators, measuring devices which add things up, subtract, multiply things. Calculator does not matter. It does not matter to the calculator if you're adding eggs or weights or liters or quarts. That is, again, what you add, what we add. When I say you, I always mean us. What we mean when we measure something, add quantities. The quantities themselves are totally meaningless and empty. Only once we assign a meaning to it, what it actually denotes, we create a context and make sense. 
So we have these two sets of tools, the tools which change matter and the tools which are measuring, quantifying, but where the quantification and what we mean with the quantification actually needs something more to it. Certainly, if you drive a nail into the wall, you can decide if this is for your coat or for a picture. So it gains further interpretation and further use. But first, most of all, it is a nail in the wall which will keep things from falling down. And that's the change of matter which you did to the wall with a hammer and with a nail. And then we had the marriage in the heavens. You see in the background, Space Odyssey 2001, the sun is rising and you have a clock in the sky and you have a calculator, the most obvious empty tools, and they decided to get married. And they begot computers. The combination of time with fixed quantities in defined states is only possible in the computer because of the marriage with time and clocks. Now there are different times, quite obviously. So we have the time of human perception and human experience, which you see on the right. These are the time frames we can perceive, where we can perceive differences happening over time, even though we are not aware of it. So if you're watching a film with 24 frames per second, we are not counting 1 to 24 every second. But we are perceiving the moving image, uh, which is moving faster, especially if you have a higher frame rate, than our senses can perceive. And we cannot say this is 24 frames per second or 48 or 96 unless we tell it by other fine differences in the images and how smooth the movement is. These time frames of our lives are not only de de defined by our perception and what we can perceive, but they're defined by our normal life, like when you came in. You came in, you knew a little before the talk starts. Someone came in a little later than the talk starts. And we most likely will go to bed tonight at some point in time when we are tired. But all these time frames are within us and within our life, our breathing. Now, absolute time is a very tricky thing. Our perception for absolute time is very limited. So if I sing now, and I don't ask you to repeat that tone I sing now. So if I sing to you, da, and I would ask you to sing exactly that duration, most of you would sing da, and not da, because you would know there is, you have this innate feeling for the duration. Now if I sing the following to you, da, and I would ask you to repeat the situation, we would get as many different results as there are people in this space. One way to remember this is by actually mapping the time into space, by saying, into movement, by saying, oh, he's saying, da. Now I can repeat it exactly the same length. It is da. because I used my body and the space and the speed of my movement to measure time. Unless you're a trained musician um, where you have learned how to deal with longer periods of time, I think that most of our imagination or perception of how long a duration is in absolute time ends probably like with four or five seconds. And after that, we have to take have other tools which help us to remember that, like the movement or like pacing up and down and saying we move with a certain speed and we get back and that was about 17 seconds. So we combine space and time in order to control time, which is also true in the mechanical clock. And then there's the other time, which is on the left side of our human time of perception and history and tradition. And it stems from the marriage of the clock with the calculator, which are 
as I said, both empty and void. And they married, and we got the chip in the middle. And the chip turns all measurements into these wiggles down there. It's either this or it's either that. It doesn't know any difference between this and that, but only that that is not this and this is not that. So it does it, and it actually has a clock that measures it and synchronizes all these different movements. This is now totally different from our human time because it's based on synchronization. Synchronization started with a clock at the factory work, that's understood. But now we are talking about a synchronization which is way smaller than our perception. Computer clocks run on in incredible speeds where no one of us can actually perceive this speed. In order to say that this event and this event inside a computer happened in a certain time frame, which the computer synchronizes, we have to draw it on a sheet of paper. We have to slow it down to look at it. So our sense of perception can perceive what the computer did in this little time, which we have no way to control, to see. We always can only perceive things and interpret things which enter through the channels of our senses. And the channels of our senses determine what we perceive. Anything that goes beyond the channels of our perception of our senses, we cannot perceive. So anything which happens at a higher speed needs to be interpreted by us, by, for instance, the outcome of a computer. Without clocks, computers would not exist, the digital computers we have. The quartz, the clock, the ticks, the synchronization makes it possible that the measurements which were done over time can be put together in a synchronized way to meet our eyes. And I'm not only talking about like um, measuring temperature, I'm talking also about text, but I will come to that. Now we have still media like text or an image which we took or a picture which are coming out of a computer and we can see it on the computer monitor. The computer has to run very fast to make this thing stand still for our eyes. The clock is running like crazy. The computer monitor refreshes. All the little things move at an incredible speed only so we can read a still text or watch or appreciate or see a still image. So this is where Lewis Carroll from the beginning comes into play. The computer has to run very fast for us to perceive something standing still. Now let's look at obviously a book. I'll come to that. It's not going to run away. It might fade over time. But even music on a vinyl record or film can be in quotes viewed. If you try to look into your CD with your regular senses, without magnification, without technical devices, you will see nothing. You will see a colorful display of light. If you try to look into the CPU of a computer, you will see nothing. You need something else to make you perceive, make us perceive what's happening and if that computer is actually doing the right thing. So even with music in vinyl, we can peek into it somehow. It does not sound, but at least we can see the sculpture of sound. And a film, we can look at each frame and then imagine maybe that the ball is going from left to right because we can synthesize it in our mind, the movement over time. Maybe not at the right speed, but kind of. So we have these two realms of time and the two realms of machines and tools. On the right hand side are our senses, our interpretation, our sense, and interestingly enough, in English, sense, making sense and senses have the same root. That's also true in German. I don't know in how, ever, how many other languages actually senses and sense have the same root. 
and we create meaning out of it, where interpretation and meaning might be intertwined, but we can have, but this is a dollhouse. So let's stick to the basics here. And on the left-hand side, you have the tools which are empty, which don't generate any content at all, which are void, like the computer or calculator, which need to enter our space, our time, the time of our senses, in order for us to make meaning and create meaning out of it. This is a fundamental part of my dollhouse that the time of our senses are the gateways through which we perceive whatever is smaller, faster, bigger than we can actually see. And they need to be scaled to enter us into our head and then we can expand it again and say, oh, this was two billion years ago, whatever that means. So this was the first chapter on tools, matter and time, the voided empty tools, the tools that change matter. And oh, I should add this here. So the void tool of the computer needs always to be connected or the clock connected to something else so we can find out if it actually worked. So even if you program something, you need a confirmation on a level which we can see or hear, which we can perceive. So we get the print out. This is the output of my program. Hello world. If it doesn't show up, then I made a mistake. But even if the CPU, the, the computer itself, is running and doing the right things, we need a logic analyzer which steps through the thing, stops it. Then we capture a picture of this thing and say, oh, this transistor works. This one did not work. Why is this not working? Then we step, go to the next step, slow it down from its incredible speed to our perception, and say, oh, now it works. Next chapter. Time across generations. Uh, you know, in this dollhouse, we can go up and down the ladders. It doesn't matter how they're connected, but they're all in one house, under one roof. So numbers and sizes have changed radically since, have changed radically their meaning for us since the advent of computers and people getting richer and inflation. So what does it mean to have a billion or two billion or three billion? I have not the faintest idea. I usually reduce this to a number of one family houses to get an idea or something similar like that. Otherwise, it doesn't mean very much to me. So we are juggling with numbers since the advent of computing. And I mean, not the scientists, I mean all of us. Our numbers are totally out of sight and out of scale for our real life. We always have to find relations to find out what they actually mean. So let me go back to some fundamentals of human life. Imagine there are 12 people holding hands and each person represents one generation. They're holding hands with the next generation. So the red person would be you today and you're holding hand with the next generation before you who holds the hand with the next generation before you. Very rarely do we have more than three to four generations living at the same time. So we have this change of only 12 people holding hands. 12 people are a fraction of you sitting here. The first two rows, which is almost nothing. In our current perception, it's almost nothing. But now let's say, let's add a timeline to it, to the generations. Let's say three generations are about 100 years, which is probably true for the last 100,000 years if you take the average and, you know, people starving too early and dying too late and all these kind of things. Let's average the generation out at 35 years or three to 100. Then it needs only 12 people holding hands to go back to 1600. Imagine 12 people standing here holding hands and playing Chinese whisper. And it goes back to 1600. Now we can play this game forever. So if we have 48 people holding hands, it goes back to 500. 48 people is such a small number in our perception. But 500, that's quite a while ago based on our education, if we can deal with this number and what it might mean and if we have an idea of what happened in between. Now imagine Chinese whisper, our history. 
the person 500 years ago is just whispering through 48 people to reach us. And it will be obviously a different message we get at the end. But it's only 48 people. So with 48 people, we say, oh, why did it get so distorted? If we say 1,500 years, we say, oh, that's so long ago, the message could have never reached us. So here are a few numbers in generations. The oldest known written doc account is 170 people holding hands. That's not, yeah, it's a little more than 48, but 170 people. And before that, we don't have any written account. The oldest known temple building is 350 people holding hands. That's as many as might come tonight to the concert. And that goes back to the very first temple ever built, or not ever built, which still remains until today. The oldest known musical instrument is 1,200 people holding hands. And actually the first anatomically modern human being, its first appearance which we know of currently, is 6,500 people holding hands. That goes back to what we call our ancestors. Now, just imagine the largest stadium in the United States holds 102,000 people. Oh, one, yeah, 102,000 people. So that's incredible. I mean, they're not holding hands. But, but yeah, 100,000 people, we say, oh, sure, 100,000 people. But if you think in generations, it's only 6,500 people standing in a row until you meet the first skeleton we found, which is related to us. And then certainly the first electronic digital computer is two and a half generations holding hands. It's almost nothing. Two and a half generations. So here are a few examples of written documents. Top left, a 30,000 old year painting in southern France. Then in the middle, the oldest written document on a piece of wood, interestingly, from what is today Greece. Then to the right, a clay tablet. I was really amazed when I found out that the oldest written document is on wood. I would have thought it would be clay. and was mistaken. At the bottom left, you see the oldest existing book print, 1150 years old, made in China. And then certainly when the mechanical printing press came about in 1470-something, that was the worldwide revolution of distribution of information. And then you see an eight-inch floppy disk, which maybe one-third of us still know, which, yeah, if you find it, you just trash it, and you say, where am I? I'm supposed to go to the computer museum in, 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 in Silicon Valley and see if they still have a drive to play it, and then they couldn't read the data, and then they wouldn't have the programs, and, so this is only 40 years old. Here you have a book. We were hoping to have the second volume out about the programming of MPAC over the last three to four years, but we didn't get it done in time for this celebration. So I have to show you the first volume, which you can look at at the ticket counter. And there is no technology needed to read this book. You don't need I need glasses, but if I hold it close enough, I could read it. I can, we can look at pictures hanging at the wall without technology. We can walk around a statue because they are in our time frame. The statue is not running away. For our perception, it's standing still. The picture is standing still, hanging still. And to read a book, yeah. Oh, this is the first book I bought in my life. You open it up and you read it. That's it. And actually you are injecting time into the book when you read it. Because the book is a still object which needs to be animated in time so we can perceive it. Because it's the document of aura, of spoken language. And in order to make sense of it, we have to reactivate it into time. And you know that quite a few of us still move the lips when they are reading. 
which is actually putting it back into time. So we have this incredible invention of mass distribution of information on a media, paper, book, which is in our time frame, which lasts, unless there's a fire or water damage, a few hundred years. It can lie in the basement or in the attic. If there is no mold, it's doing fine. And someone finds it and opens it up, does not need a computer, and just reads it. It's very nice. Then you see, on the right hand, the archive chair, which is in the lobby. So we were finally able, after a few years, to put this archive chair together. And you can watch moving images. You know that MPAC is about time-based art. So everything we do moves on a timeline. So it doesn't fit into a book. The book is only captured images, still images, where you might read a text, and then maybe something starts moving in your head as you're re looking at the image or several images, and you kind of envision what it was. In the archive chair, you can see the videos of the documentation of events, 600 so far videos of events at MPAC. You just click on the computer screen. It shows as a still frozen image, moving very fast, the database. And then the image moves. What is important in the context of MPAC and time-based art is that the documentation is not the event. It sounds silly, everyone understands it, but there is still no way of capturing an experience which happens around us in time, evolves over time to capture it in such a way that I can just be in that place. We can do that with audio up to a certain extent, but with visual stuff, we cannot do it. And even VR, 360, all that stuff, it's totally clunky and you always know it's not, that's not it. Whereas if you listen, to, for instance, to the uh, technical reproduction of music, you put on your headphones and you are there. Because it's one sense and it has a different bandwidth, it works differently than the eyes and our physical proprioception, perception, our orientation in space. So we can only document time-based art. There is no way what you experience over this celebration, the events, that you will ever experience it again never identical, maybe it won't be performed again. And that was it. We have a video documentation, a 2D documentation, and you know that even 3D in, in video is fake and it's not 3D. It's all these funny things which, where you can't look behind them and the holodeck does not exist and holography does not work either in that sense. So let's forget about capturing reality and let's live with the 2D documentation on a timeline. So now we are stuck here at MPAC. We do all time-based art. And in the end, no one cares, right? Because this society is all about preserving things. We want to repeat it. We want to have the same experience. We want to have that immersive environment again. So we don't value the moment when we as human beings, as you are now here, share this time and then it's gone. And we may never remember what Johannes said, but that's totally fine because now we are here. Why worry about the future? Well, in this case, you could maybe watch the video if you wanted to, which would not give you the same feeling as sitting in this space. So the next ch chapter, making digital data run and stand still and run again, because what in my little dollhouse so far is clear that digital data has to run in order to stand still. Now, but when it stands still, it does not stand still because the computer is still, has still electricity and it's still running. It only seems to stand still for us and for our senses. Now this gets a little more in some technical concepts, but since I don't understand technical concepts very well, it is my dollhouse and I'm just presenting with you with this framework, with these concepts of technology.
What, and what I'm going to talk about now and leading to the digital time capsule is actually something we have worked here at MPAC for the past two and a half years, because maybe because I'm getting old and running out of time, I'm all of a sudden thinking out about preserving certain things, which I never cared about in my previous life. I never documented anything I did, but now, oh, we did all these things and assume the university doesn't give any more money for MPAC. Then we have all this video archive and all these things. Who's going to take care of it? Where does it go? Who maintains it? Will anyone know what we did? Yes, they will find the book. And the book will tell them something. If they find an eight inch floppy disk or a SSD drive from today, they will plug it in. After 20 years, they might not find anything. Or it might be in formats which they cannot read. So it's gone, the time machine. It's not only running on time, it's swallowing time. Or it's very difficult to grab it and make it stand still, like in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. OK, so the computer technology as more, and I'm you remember, please remember, when you are looking at a dollhouse of a child, you don't say, I know all this. Don't tell it. Don't tell me again. It's a, it's a dollhouse. So we have three things in the world of computers, hardware, programs, and storage. As you can see in the top corners, the hardware needs electricity. And top right, we hope to store things without electricity. And in between, other programs, and I'm including, for those who know better, I'm including the operating systems under programs. So what happens, well, we want to save the so-called data when the computer is not turned on. So we need so-called data retention. The computer is turned off, it forgets everything, so it needs to have the data somewhere else where it can store the data without being connected to electricity. And that's called non-volatile storage. Now, it took me a while to figure out that non-volatile is really a euphemism. It is very volatile. It goes away like crazy. If you try to keep your digital images just on one hard disk, which you took 15 years ago, and you wait another five years, they will most likely be gone. So it's very volatile compared to our human time scale. If you have a printed photo of it, It'll be good for 50 to 70 years, so way at least beyond my lifetime, of hopefully not everyone's lifetime here, but it'll be good for that time. So let's look at these things. So the non-volatile memory to the right, and I would like to talk about why it is not volatile, not non-volatile, and how long it is expected to last, based on experience, on tests, and all these kind of things, which are done in the technical world. So you, some of you might remember CDs from a previous life. So CDs and DVDs could be manufactured in factories, which was a totally different process than when you write your own data to a CD or DVD. It's a different chemical process. It's a different mechanical process. So the ones which get stamped in the factory or injection molded could last up to 100 years, but Beware of UV, sunlight, and oxygen. Oxygen, you know a CD? Little thin thing. Oxygen creeps in there. And you have a reflective layer, which is usually some metal alloy. Oxygen and metal alloys love each other, so they eat each other up. So if you have oxygen creeping into your beloved CDs, there is no reflective layer and the laser cannot read it anymore. And it's a beautiful oxidization color of rusty red when you leave your CDs out. Likewise, writable CDs, so optical media, so-called optical media, which you can write at home, uh, they are prone to fail from light, from oxygen, from temperature and humidity. So they have materials inside 
which are very sensitive to temperature and humidity changes. So in order to keep them for the rest of your life, you can only keep them at a certain temperature level and humidity level. It needs to be controlled, otherwise the oxidation starts and everything falls apart. Likewise, likewise with DVDs, so, so DVDs for those of you who don't, of, of don't remember DVDs, they hold, they hold about uh, eight times six, yeah, about eight times as much data as a, as a CD. And so they're equally constructed of material, of different material layers, which oxidize, which cannot be read anymore, which fall apart, all these kind of things. Then we have blue rays, which hold up to eight times four, 32 times as much as a, as a CD, and, but they go up to much higher density of packed data. So they're also susceptible to light, oxygen, temperature, and humidity. And that is mainly now not the data layer for of those of you who are into technology, but it's a reflective layer. So these optical media are read by, if you put them in your CD or DVD player or in your computer, there's a laser basically shooting up and going down again. And depending on the amount of reflection it gets, it says it's a zero or a one. And then it puts it back together with the synchronized machine, the computer, and says, oh, this is da 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 da. It's really that simple. Then we have digital tapes, which is the latest for the past 20 years, I guess. It's, it's all even longer videotape based, and it's the small LTO tapes, and you can write lots of data on them. And they last about 5 to 25 years. So you see, we're going down. The higher the density, and now we are into magnetizing materials with these, uh, with these digital tapes. And what I was amazed, just two weeks ago, I found out that if you increase, so this, the digital tape is estimated to last 25 years and hold the data for 25 years. If you increase the humidity in the storage space by only 10%, it drops down to five years. So you see, it's, it's an incredible impact which the, which the conditioning, the air conditioning of a space has on data retention. Then the hard drives, which many of us still have, five to eight years, everyone will tell you that they are really lucky and it, they had a hard drive lasting 12 years and they were still able to retain to, to get the data back. But from a professional perspective, five to eight years is the expected lifetime of data you have on a hard disk, unless you copy it again to a new hard disk. And who does that? Most of us don't. And then you have the new solid state, in quotes, drives. They don't drive, they stand still. They work on a different level. But these, th these solid state things, which you are currently buying for about four to five times the price of a hard drive lasts up to 10 years, and it depends on how often you write data to them. It doesn't matter how often you read, but because they have this thing of trapping electrons and all these kind of things, if you write too many times to them, they just lose the information, and then that's that. So you see that, and if you put it in the cloud, so I talked to many people, they said, I talked to some, what was this, chief scientific officer of something, and I told him about my problem here at MPAC that I want to preserve the data. And he said, well, just put it in the cloud. I said, wait, the cloud? I don't own the cloud. If the company goes broke, I have no right to my data. They don't give me my data back. And you might have heard of, of Apple and iTunes of keeping their stuff, even though you bought it and all these kind of things. So I want to own my own data. And as you can see here from the data retention, that's really difficult. Every five years, who copies, who checks the bits on their, on their devices? So then we have in the middle, so we talked about the data, so-called non-volatile data, which expires after five to eight years. So here we talk about software companies and hardware, the programs, which, as you know, are driven by the so-called innovation cycle and by obsolescence, which are hand and glove, the two. 
you don't know if the innovation actually gives you innovation or not, but it's not compatible anymore. So you have to buy the new machines and the software companies and hardware companies are actually in one boat. So if the hardware changes, then the software might not work anymore. And if the software changes, then the data format changes and you can't open old files. So this is, a, is, a, is really something totally outside of our control. And how long does all this last? How long can we rely on something? So now programs and operating systems need to be stored outside of time on non-volatile memory. And I will, storage, I will explain that. So anyhow, the programs cannot remain in the running computer. They need to be somewhere outside on a hard disk, on your solid state, on your memory stick, wherever, where they don't need electricity to stay alive. Whereas inside a computer, if you turn it off, the data which is in the, in the RAM and in the CPU and everywhere is just flushed and gone. It's not there anymore. So let's assume that the actual hardware, the chips, oh, what it says at the very bottom, the question I'm discussing all the time, is how long does the medium last? For how long can we access, see, read, and listen to what is stored? So I talked about the non-volatile storage, which is volatile, about the programs, which is totally outside of our control, how the hardware changes and software changes and how we can stay up to date. And now talking about the hardware, let's assume for a moment that hardware actually runs. Let's say the chips and transistors and capacitors and resistors and the soldering and the connectors and the cabling last for 100 years, say. They just last. That's what we assume. Uh, then the only question is, how does actually a computer start once electricity is turned on, top left? You see, no electricity, computer is dead, doesn't do anything. You press the button, it starts up. Now, how does that actually work? So at the top left, you see the guy cranking his car. It's mechanical energy created to make the motor run. And once it gets synchronized, it has enough energy, it goes and runs on its own. The same is true for computers, because the car is dead before you crank it. And the same is true for computers before you turn it on and it, you don't crank it so it knows in which sequence to do things. It doesn't do anything. So in the middle, you see these punch cards from the 50s. You see the holes in there. So when a computer was turned on in the 50s, you had this stack of cards, which was read by a mechanical device, which looked at the mechanical electrical, which looked at the holes, and then sent that as an electric, electric signal to the CPU of the computer and said, this is how you should configure yourself. So there was a matter, something in the time frame of us human beings, a piece of cardboard with holes, like the guy cranking the machine, which actually told the computer, oh, you're turned on. Now the machine has to reach a fundamental configuration so it can start. The next generation then was this thing to the right, where at the bottom you can see little switches. And when you turn the computer on, you had to toggle these switches in a certain sequence, looking at a, at a sheet of paper, and that's what I still did when I started with computers with a, not KL10, but KA10. So you toggle these switches and then there's a magnetic tape here. And once you toggle it in the right sequence, the magnetic tape moved and read the operating instructions from a tape, from a mag mag magnetic storage, which then set the machine in motion. And today we don't have all these devices, but we have this little EEPROM, it's called, this little chip down at the bottom, which holds the information, this cranking the car, which holds that information even when the electricity is turned on. So you turn on the electricity, this guy sends the stack of cards or the toggling of the switches to the computer, and it, I only, it occurred to me only, it's called the BIOS, bio life, right? It only occurred to me two weeks ago what a euphemism it is again. It stands for Basic Input-Output System. 
So it basically tells the computer, okay, now you have to look at the tape and get the operating system and all that stuff, and you connect to the outside world. That's what this chip does. If this chip does not work, the computer will not start. If it has lost its information, you can try to reboot it, it won't start again. And that's called booting. So this chip is today, with a little different technology, is basically ho is the crank of the machine. If this chip does not work, our computer will not start. So the question is, how long does such a chip, the crank, actually hold its information? As everything stored in electronic form, it will lose its information over time. It is a time machine after all. So now you understand why the computer is a time machine, not only because it runs at very small increments of time and outside of our time, but also loses everything. It's a time machine. Everything which is time-based does change and get lost over time. It's a definition of time. So after a while, the computer doesn't start and Eric Amherst and I looked very much into how long does this chip last? I had no idea when we started going down this rabbit hole. It was almost impossible to find out which chips are, in the, are the crank in a computer, what's the quality of their manufacturing, how long do they last. You, we are not told, because when the computer is dead, we are supposed to buy a new one. It's, it's, it's very simple. So they last 10 years, other technology, other chemical configurations, may last 40 years, they may last 100 years. We are not quite sure. No one tells us. We can find the data online, what the test procedures are and the accelerated aging tests they do with these chips. But you really don't know. But now we know the computer does not start without this. So let's come to the final chapter, the digital time capsule. So all we know so far is there is no way to rely on a computer, on the data, on the programs to last for our lifetime, independent of how short or long our lifetime will be. There's no way. We can bet that I just talked to someone who bought a Hummer in the 90s, and he could not open the PDF of the Hummer manuals from the 90s because the PDF format in the 90s was still proprietary to Adobe, and only in 2007 it became an ISO standard and is now an open standard, so he could not fix his car. And that's within the, you know, a Hummer is not a cheap thing, you know, so. Okay. A time capsule uh, holds a snapshot of a moment, like in a cornerstone of a building where they put items into it, photos, newspaper, little items of that moment in time when the building was built. They put it into the cornerstone, and once the building gets destroyed, people discover the time capsule and say, oh, look at this. They looked so funny back then. <laughs> and it's the same, the CD, they shot into outer space with the most beautiful music on the planet Earth. Uh, and they hope someone will be able to read it. Okay. <laughs> so, after everything I said in my tour through my uh, dollhouse, a digital time ca capsule is a contradiction in, its, in itself, on its own. Because digital does not go along with time capsule. It has a life cycle which has nothing to do with our human life cycle. On the one hand, the computer runs faster than we can perceive, and then the data also goes faster away than we can think. Because we still expect a hard disk to last as long as a printed book, which it, obviously we know by now is not true. So I, we wanted to develop a digital archive, and let me just read this. A digital archive that keeps documents, which means images, texts, numbers, moving images, audio, accessible for our senses and our human time for two to three human generations, a hundred years. And that is modest compared to the libraries which all the kings and popes build 
They didn't think about three generations, they thought for eternity, and they are still around, these libraries. So we are very modest. Just a hundred years, please. Just to hand it over to the next generation and maybe to the generation afterwards, which none of your snapshots will ever reach. A digital archive that can be stored at environmental conditions and fluctuations which are fine for us humans, so no need for electricity and associated cost for air conditioning to keep the data. I mentioned how the environmental conditioning conditions actually influence the longevity of the data. I don't want to care about that. I just want to put it in the corner. And it's good for what is good for us human beings, as far as humidity range and temperature is controlled, no extreme situations. But let's forget, I don't want to pay all the time for air conditioning especially because if I don't leave any money to my kids, they will just turn off the air conditioning and then the data goes. Mm. Mm. Then the archive that is under our personal or institutional control without needing continuous funding. So I want to have an archive which does not depend on someone closing down MPAC and I'm not, by the way, there is no danger. I'm just... I can always think about things which are not happened yet. So, so if MPAC is gone, I don't want this, all this stuff to just you know, go down the drain. I want someone to know about it, what this building was built for with all its infrastructure and what we did. So I want to have it under my control and not under the control of the cloud. And even the government cannot keep up with maintaining all its data. And in the course of this search, less research, more search, I even looked into the uh, Mormon archive in the mountains in Salt Lake City, how they preserve all their data. It's amazing how people struggle with just trying to keep data which exists only in the digital realm. Then, Oh, the time capsule of the digital should be, able, should be discovered in a forgotten box. I want someone to come into a building which is falling apart, go to the attic or to the basement and find a box, open it up and say, oh shit, it's no box. Okay, it's this technology. Let's plug it together and see what's inside. So this is our solution. And as I said, this is the dollhouse. I'm not going to give you all the, I'm almost done now. I'm not going to give you all the technical background about data formats and heaven knows what, which we, what we investigated. I will just tell you the solution we found. There's only one storage medium, which is the so-called M-disk, which does not oxidize, which is heat resistance. It does not get influenced by humidity. It's called M-Disc because of Millennia Disc. It was actually developed at Brigham Young University and I met with the chemists and the electrical engineering faculty who developed the patent on this. What is interesting, this is the only medium which you can put in a box in your attic. It has been tested, not only accelerated tested, it will be there. The problem is you need a device to read it. And you need a computer that starts up. What good is a DVD 200 years from now and you don't have the stuff to read it? And you don't know about the data formats and you don't have the programs anymore and everything has changed. So this time capsule actually holds now these five components, which is the biggest is actually the monitor which is ridiculous because probably you could find a monitor a hundred years from now where you just look at the pins and get the signal out. So that's no wizardry. Then to the left, you see the computer, which is the Nook, Nuck, Nook. How do you pronounce it? Eric. <laughs> Nuck, oh, that's difficult for a German. Okay, so the Nuck which is a little box, as you see it, it's, it's only this big, the things are to scale, kind of. It costs five, oh, I come to the price. It is totally transparent, so we can actually, the crank I talked about, we can reprogram it, we can refresh it. 
so it doesn't lose its information. And it's all transparent. It can get its operating system from a DVD, which you have written on this eternal DVD. It reads the operating system, then it loads the programs, and it's happy as long as the hardware is happy with all its transistors and resistors and cabling and all these kind of things, which we assume will last much longer than industry gives us for the crank to crank the machine and for the technology itself. Then you might need a keyboard, which is also fairly easy to build. And you need the Blu-ray or DVD player right or to the left. And this M-Disc, there are quite a few. This was a big fiasco, and I will not talk about it. The company did, it was a startup. They manufactured this M-Disc. They had 50 uh, DVD Blu-ray manufacturers raising the power of the laser inside their rider, and they basically failed because the guys who were running the business side were not able to convince the big archives that this was the medium and how to go about it. And, and when I met with the inventors, and I seemed to be a salesperson on a certain level, they said, yeah, if you would have talked to the big archives, they would have gotten it that this is really the thing. And they were not able to communicate that. So you can still buy them. They're still available. You can buy actually a truck full of these M-discs, and they will not deteriorate. You can ride them in 50 years from now. They still will be fine based on all the research we did. So here's the cost of it. The whole bundle costs $1,000. That's the cheapest archive you can ever have. And I will read what it says at the bottom. So this is only a DVD. And as I said, I will not go into details about how files can be spread and what, how all that works. So the DVDs to store one terabyte of data. One terabyte is what probably quite a few of, still, of you still have in their computer with all the messy stuff which you saw on my desktop, which I probably will never look again for the rest of my life. So one terabyte of this 100-year storage would cost $650 to put there. Now, to give you an idea what one terabyte means, it's about 250 to 500 million pages of text. Well, no one can write that much in your life, so your legacy can't be that big, right? And $650 to hand it over to the next generation is quite all right. Then, to give you an idea of what this data means, because there will be many people who say, DVD holds too little data, we need more data, denser storage. No, that's all BS, because the denser you pack your data, the sooner you lose it. That's it. That's, that's another rule. And we take only commercial products which are off the shelf. So no specific development, no special stuff things which are known through industry, which industry and banks and the military will need. That's a safe bet. And then we can go from there. So a shelf which is about as tall as I am and about this wide can hold with the DVDs, again, without air conditioning, in your living room, in your basement. It can hold 70,000 hours of stereo sound at highest MP3. 70,000 hours means eight years continuously listening to something. And at the, at the major bottleneck is actually with video, so it would hold like 3,000 hours of current HD streaming video compression. So we can go into these details or not go into them, but if you have a shelf this big, which holds 3,000 hours of pretty good perceivable quality of, of video, that is very densely packed, actually. And someone else will say, but I can put it on this little thing. And I say, well, how long can you access this little thing with this high density of packing? Let me come briefly back to the M-Disc. So since the company had a bad website, and I started reading the patents, and I said, certainly don't understand the patents, but only the dollhouse of the patents. So we did actually at RPI research of these M-Discs to see if the claim that these uh, materials would not oxidize and would have only ingredients which would sustain heat and humidity. We actually went to the mass spectrum analyzer here at RPI. We cut it apart. So these are the bits on a 
on a DVD, so we magnified it very, very big. Then we cut a hole in, we, he, the expert, he, the expert, cut a hole into it. And this is the hole. And here you can see the analysis of the material in the disc, and that there is indeed no big amount of, uh, of material that can oxidize or lose its, its consistency over time. And I verified this with the inventors of the DVD, and we verified it here in the lab. It was great to work at a university where you can go to someone and say, could you tell me what the material components of this thing are? So the only drawback of this whole system is, I told you about the cranking of the machine. This cranking the machine is part of any computer, of any DVD player, of any fridge which talks to the internet, of any digital component. You need this EEPROM when you turn on the power that it knows what to do or does the right thing. So to be on the safe side, if you turn on your DVD player and your computer every eight years, so that's the only maintenance cycle you need. You don't need air handling, you don't need much money, you just need storage space somewhere. And you turn them, have a clock on a calendar, and every eight years you turn it on and say, okay, I'm going to refresh the cranking chip on the DVD player or Blu-ray player and on the computer. If you do that, it will last longer than I. So that is the only maintenance cycle that is needed. And, and all the data on the disks will be there, the programs will be there, the operating systems will be there. And if you lose the soldering and you're an institution, then you don't buy one, spend $1,000 on these systems. It's like we do here at MPAC. We just buy eight of these systems. You have the redundancy and you're ready, set, go with this archive. The investment is the time of writing the DVDs. So this is the end of the talk, the book, time-based art, moving media, no one stores media again on film, but Hollywood. The digitally made films in Hollywood are exposed onto a polyester-based film because they don't trust the digital data, but they trust the real exposed chemically processed polyester film to keep their biggest investment. And we should learn something from that. So we print the book with still images. If someone 100 years from now looks at the book, they can imagine in their fantasy, for right or wrong, what it was as we look at documents from 500 years ago and we dream up what it must have been and we do all the research. Or they find the, the disks, puzzle them together and say, oh, this is interesting, this is what it was. Thank you very much. I went over the time quite a bit. I would prefer to not do question and answers now because it's kind of stuffy in here. Please don't see this as a recusal of myself or as an excuse, but I, it's always difficult if so many people have stayed together for such a long time to be patient with different questions and answers. You can always approach me and there's more technical information which has not been written down yet. But this is not only the doll house. Far, far away is a real concrete house cast into concrete. And we are going to base our archive on this technology. Thank you.